first I'd like to just thank the spon my sponsors, um, which is the uh, uh, UK Research Council's um, program on greenhouse gas control, which uh, Phil, uh, the other Phil, is involved in. Um, and I'd also like to thank my co-authors on this, but of course, any of the views I express on my own. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the, the idea of increasing ocean alkalinity um, is uh, essentially it's a way of, um, of using a process that happens within nature, and that's the process of weathering, um, but enhancing that on a, on a, a time scale that's relevant for the problem that we're, we're talking about. And I've put on the screen there one weathering reaction, and that's the weathering of, of a mineral called phosphorite or olivine. Um, and what's happening there is on the, uh, the left-hand side of the arrow, you have your weathering reaction, you, the olivine is dissolving. And on the right-hand side of the arrow, you have um, the weathering products, which are magnesium ions that are dissolved in water and you have bicarbonate ions that are dissolved in water. And it's those bicarbonate ions that are the, essentially the storage um, reservoir for this, this carbon. So we're not talking, in this case, of precipitating any minerals to store the carbon, but we want to keep the carbon dissolved as bicarbonate. Um, if you can click the button along, please. So the, the benefit of, of storing the carbon as bicarbonate is that you get essentially two for one in terms of carbon to magnesium or calcium um, when you're talking about dissolving a silicate mineral, so something like phosphorite, when that dissolves you capture two carbon for every magnesium. Um, but it, storing it uh, using bicarbonate as your storage mechanism, you also um, open up the possibility of using carbonate minerals to, to store carbon. And we know that they weather a lot quicker than the silicate minerals. Um, there's a problem here though, and that is that the, um, the carbonate minerals, in, in this case calcite, doesn't spontaneously dissolve. If you go to the next slide, please. What I've shown here is a profile, an alkalinity profile through this, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can see that alkalinity changes with depth. But the important point on this uh, image is that above the black line represents the, satur the, the black line represents the saturation horizon for carbonate minerals, for aragonite or calcite. And above that line, we know that carbonate minerals aren't going to dissolve in the ocean. So we can't just put minerals, uh, carbonate minerals into the ocean and expect them to dissolve because above that line, they're super saturated. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so to get your carbonate mineral to dissolve, we need to do some work to it. Um, we could either change the environment in which the carbonate mineral is dissolving and increase the, the, the CO2 concentration. Um, and this is the idea that um, called the accelerated weathering of limestone, where you put your, your carbonate into a, a reactor with high CO2, and that forces the dissolution. We can also create our own highly reactive minerals. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we can create um, uh, react more reactive minerals uh, by putting uh, carbonate minerals into a lime kiln and creating a mineral like Portlandite. And we know that that rapidly dissolves um, at ambient conditions. Um, and just to plug for another project I'm involved in, uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, material streams from uh, from different industries where these sorts of minerals are, are produced. So the iron and steel industry is, is an example of that. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is quite a, a complicated slide. Um, the dynamics of carbon in the ocean are, are quite complex. But the important point I want you to take away from this slide is that the concentration of carbon in the oceans is, is large. It's uh, for, about 40 times um, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. But you can see that the, the two arrows going out of the, the ocean are really quite small. Um, now that means that the, the carbon residence time in the ocean is something on the order of a million years. So it's really long lived within the ocean. Um, now the, the, the big question I suppose within uh, increasing ocean alkalinity as a carbon store is if we increase um, uh, carbon in the oceans, does that increase the rate at which it, it um, flows out of the oceans? And that's a big unknown within this, this field. But um, the question is, well, if it's a million years residence time um, and that decreases to half a million years, and that's still relevant uh, carbon store, permanent carbon store for what we need. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, 
Um, so there's a whole range of different uh, uh, proposals. I wouldn't call them technologies, but proposals that have been put forward to increase ocean alkalinity. So there's things like enhanced weathering, which which is dissolving minerals on the land surface, or enhanced weathering, adding minerals to the coast or directly to the ocean. Um, and there's more sort of industrial type technologies um, of dissolving minerals in reactors like the accelerated weathering of limestone, electrochemical weathering, or turning um, your carbonate into lime and putting that onto the oceans. And I, I don't have time to go into um, all of these technologies and all of the, the, the caveats behind those. But what I wanted to do with this talk is just focus on the, the, the shared environmental impact that these technologies have on the ocean, and that's increasing ocean bicarbonate. Um, so the, all of these technologies have the same essentially underlying storage, carbon storage mechanism, and that's creating bicarbonate within the ocean. So that's what this talk's going to focus on. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, just as a, a quick overview, the, um, the, the, this is a, uh, just a review of, of some of the costs that have been put forward for these ideas. And while I wouldn't expect these costs to be particularly accurate um, per se, but they do show that the range of costs might be comparable to some of the other ideas that have been put forward to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. So on a, just on a cost basis, this isn't something that we should um, discard at the moment. It's certainly something that seems reasonably competitive. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so you've probably seen the, the top uh, panel in this diagram before, it's showing the CO2 concentration through time for the past 800,000 years. Um, and that shows the, the, the fluctuations of CO2 between glacial and interglacial cycles. The bottom panel may be something you haven't seen before, and that's um, a re re recreation of the saturation state of carbonate within the oceans um, over the same time period. And um, you can see that it fluctuates um, within that time period between six and eight. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so the uh, so the going um, so going down on the the omega calcite axis, the y-axis on on that graph is essentially what ocean acidification in is, and it's bad news for shell forming organisms within the ocean. And we might want to es essentially be somewhere within that. Um, uh, within the historic data points um, if we want to protect marine organisms. If you click the next button, of course going over that might end up uh, having a negative environmental impact as well. So um, there is potentially within, within this diagram um, a, a boundary for us to aim for. If you click to the next slide please. Um, this is some modeling work I did where I looked at a business as usual emission scenario and that's the red line on both of those graphs. And you can see that the CO2 increases potentially over the next 100 years. And the red line on the bottom right hand pane is what would happen to the carbonate saturation state in the oceans. And that's essentially ocean acidification. Now, the blue line represents if we, um, if all we did was increase ocean alkalinity to counteract that, and I'm not suggesting that as a potential option, um, we'd end up with essentially a saturation state in the ocean that was restored to what pre-industrial levels were. So in the worst case scenario, we would be restoring um, saturation states to pre-industrial level. And probably in a more realistic scenario, we would be um, mitigating the effects of ocean acidification. Um, so this is essentially the broad scale, the very um, fundamental intrinsic environmental impact of each of these technologies. Um, if you click the next slide, please. Of course, it's not as, as simple as that. And um, this image was produced by um, modeling the uh, impact on the ocean, the spatial distribution of that impact, if you only added the alkalinity in one or two places. So if we don't, if we don't spread out the, the addition, we might end up with hot spots. And if you click on the next slide, please. Okay, so I don't want to give you the impression that all of this, uh, all of these uh, impacts are benign, but it's essentially the, the intrinsic um, impact behind all of these seems to be relatively benign, and they all have their own um, uh, potential impacts uh, that we, and it, uh, to understand um, the impact of, uh, of any of these on the environment, we need to go to a higher resolution and, and look at the, the technologies uh, individually. Mm -hmm.